Clancy Pasta presents Something Else Entirely, written by Sammy Scott. The conference would take me away from home for only two days, but Amy was still nervous about it. This was the first time since the night of our wedding that she would be sleeping alone, and the house was still new enough to us to carry that slight unsettling air of unfamiliarity. It didn't help that the move had taken a city girl out of the city, leaving Amy to long for the comforting sounds of traffic and the chatter of nearby neighbors. We had traded those familiar surroundings for a rancher in the middle of the woods, its front yard spotted with looming pines and bisected by a narrow dirt driveway, nearly half a mile long, that ended in a winding gravel road yet another mile or so away from our closest neighbors, whom we had yet to meet. It's only two nights, babe. I reminded her as I straightened my tie in the mirror. She stood behind me apprehensively, intentionally or not blocking my exit from the bathroom. She was trying to guilt me into staying, even though she knew I had no choice, and I smiled at the side of her pouty lower lip. That lip had worked its magic on me more than once in the past. I know, she said. I turned around and gave her a peck on the lips. She pulled me close, kissing me more deeply, forcing me to be the one to break our embrace. You said you were looking forward to some time to yourself to decorate, I reminded her. That's what I said, she responded. And if it gets too quiet, you can raise the roof with some Miley Cyrus and I won't be here to complain. She rolled her eyes, smiled, but just barely, and retreated just far enough for me to squeeze through the bathroom door. She shadowed me to the kitchen, where I reached down to pick up my briefcase. Sybil, our long-haired white cat, rubbed her cheek against the back of my hand and I gave her an absent-minded scratch behind the ears. Plus, you've got Sybil to keep you company. Our vicious attack cat. I stood, briefcase in hand. Amy, still dressed in a white terry cloth robe she had donned after her morning shower, scooped up the cat and held her close to her chest. I could hear Sybil purring loudly, and I scratched her again. The feline gazed at me lazily with shining green eyes. You have the phone number at the hotel? Yes, Amy said. Call me any time, okay? And I'll call you when the plane lands. Call me when you get to the airport, she insisted. I stepped forward and kissed her again, the cat between us, and I could feel Sybil's motor vibrating against my chest. I stepped through the door connecting the kitchen to the garage. Bye, babe, I said over my shoulder as I tapped the button to raise the garage door. The room was filled with the sound of the door ascending, the morning sunshine sliced into the room, light bouncing off the surface of my car. As I reached for the door handle, I caught sight of something just outside, crouched in the driveway. It was little more than a silhouette in the blinding light of the low sun, but best I could tell, it was a rather large rat, or perhaps a possum. Its back end was raised, head low, its fur raised in gleaming black spikes. I didn't have much time to study the animal, because Amy suddenly let out a loud gasp that startled me, and the next thing I saw was Sybil sailing through the air beside me as she leapt from Amy's arms. The cat made silent contact with the concrete floor of the garage, it was out the door before I could even react. The other animal, the rat or the possum or whatever it was, darted away and Sybil disappeared after it. No! Amy cried out, and the two of us walked quickly together to the door of the garage. It took a moment for my eyes to adjust to the sunlight. A rustling of leaves and branches betrayed where the animals had disappeared into the woods on the north side of the yard. We stood and stared. Sybil? Amy cried out, small panic in her voice, and I stifled a chuckle. Never had the cat responded to the sound of her name, nor did we often use it. We were more likely to call her Kitty or Sibs, 
or fuzzy butt, or, in my case, idiot, than we were to ever call her Sybil. Amy looked at me pleadingly. She'll come back, I said. Don't worry. I might as well have asked Amy not to breathe. But what if she doesn't, she asked. Cats always do, I said, making my way back into the garage and towards the car. Eric, she called after me. I looked at my watch. I have to go, babe. I'll miss my flight. I gave her another quick peck on the lips, which were dry and pressed tightly together. She looked defeated. I cursed the cat's terrible timing. I reluctantly got into the car, started the engine, and rolled down the driver's side window. Amy leaned over to look inside, her arms crossed. She'll come back, I said again. Love you. You are my sunshine. I began backing the car out of the garage. My only sunshine. She responded quietly and stepped back from the car. An hour later at the airport, I called Amy. Hey, she said. I'm at the airport. Got about 20 minutes until departure and everything's on time. Good, she responded. Her tone was soft. Any sign of the idiot? I asked. No, she sighed. She'll come back. So you said, she responded. Babe, it'll be fine, I said, adopting a lighter tone. Just try to distract yourself for a while. If you stand around fretting about it, she'll never return. Just dive into something and the next thing you know, she'll be at the front door. She sighed again. You're probably right. I know I'm right. Okay, she said. Call me when you land? Will do. Love you. You are my sunshine. But I didn't call Amy when the plane landed. I was met at the gate by an engineer from the job site. Instead of continuing on to the hotel as planned, I was whisked away to an impromptu meeting with several higher-ups and in the ensuing bustle and stress, I completely forgot about Amy. It wasn't until several hours later that I finally opened the door to my hotel room. I threw the briefcase down on the bed and collapsed face down beside it. The bedspread smelled musty. My skin felt greasy and I couldn't wait to lose my tie. But first, I rolled over, pulling my phone out of my pocket, expecting several missed calls. But there were only two. Hey, it's me, Amy said in the first one. I think you forgot to call me when you landed, so call me when you get this. Her tone was light and surprisingly upbeat. Me again, began the second message. Just let me know you're okay, okay? She chuckled a bit. Sibs isn't back yet, but I have an idea. I dialed Amy's cell and sat up on the bed. Hey, stranger, she answered. Sorry, babe, I said, loosening my tie with my free hand. Dan Stevens met me at the airport and took me right to the job site. I literally haven't had a free moment until right now. That's what I figured, she said. It's okay. Everything going all right? You must be exhausted. I am, I responded, realizing that I was. Typically a night owl, tonight all I wanted to do was take a scalding shower and fall asleep. I think I'll call it an early night. Still no sign of the cat? No, but I have an idea, she said. And by her tone, I could tell she was smiling. Yeah? What's that? I asked. I raised the garage door, just a bit, like maybe eight inches, and I put a plate of tuna inside that rabbit trap we found. It took me a minute to picture what Amy was saying, and then I remembered that among the random junk we inherited when we bought the rancher was a rabbit trap, a small rectangular cage that would snap shut when a center mechanism was triggered. It was actually a good idea. Sibs would come in, 
go for the tuna, and be stuck in the cage until morning. Do you know how to set the trap? I asked. Yes, I know how to set the trap, she said, in an exaggerated tone. I'm not that helpless. No, you're not that helpless. I yawned loudly. Go to bed, she insisted. Wake up tomorrow and be brilliant. Will do. Love you, babe. You are my sunshine. My only sunshine, she responded. Our call ended. I woke up the next morning sprawled across the bed, my skin cold from sleeping alone. I stretched, my feet poking out from under the covers. A sliver of light was shining from between the curtains, stabbing me in the eyes. I sat up and looked at the bedside clock. It was 7.23 a.m. I had plenty of time to grab breakfast and a shower before I needed to report to the job site. Picking up my phone, I saw that I had a text for Mamie. Call me when you wake up, it said. I called. She answered immediately. Hey, babe, I said. Hey, she answered. Her voice was hushed. You okay? I asked. Did Sibs come back? Amy hesitated. She did, she said softly. Okay, I responded. What's wrong? Is she hurt? No, she's... Amy began, but she didn't finish. What is it? I asked. I heard a noise from the other end of the phone, and recognized it as the sound of a knob being turned, and a door being opened. I heard Amy's feet as they scuffled across concrete. I knew she was in the garage. The next sound I heard was hard to distinguish at first, but it grew louder as Amy got closer to it. It was a low meowing sound, mournful and slow. Is that Sibs? I asked. Yes. I've never heard her make that sound before. Me neither. Where is she? She's still in the cage. Still in the cage? Is she injured? I asked again. I can't tell, Amy said. There was a long pause, and then she said, Eric, I think something's wrong. What? I asked. Just... She hesitated again. Well, look. A second later, my phone chimed with a new message. I opened it up, and the screen filled with an image. There was the cage, situated in the middle of our garage, where my car was normally parked. Sybil was lying in the middle of it, looking directly at the camera. She seemed calm, but her wide eyes looked more yellow than green, something I chalked up to a trick of the light, and her mouth was hanging slightly open. She almost looked surprised. Her coat was as wide as always, if a little disheveled. I saw no signs of injury. Amy? I asked. What is it? She looks fine. Something's not right, Amy said. I don't know. Something's not right. My morning was filled with meetings, during one of which I was scheduled to present. It took a conscious effort to shake Amy and that stupid cat out of my mind. I had reassured her that I would check in with her again as soon as possible, but it might be lunchtime or later before the opportunity would allow. To my relief, it only took me a couple of minutes into my presentation to hit my stride. But when it was over, I was awarded with several handshakes and pats on the back that momentarily made me forget about any drama at home. Shortly after noon, I was walking down a hallway to the men's room, relieved to be free of the conference room for the first time all morning. I pulled my phone from my pocket and was greeted with several text messages from Amy. Each one contained a picture of Sybil. The cow was no longer in the cage, but inside the house. 
Sybil on a kitchen chair. Sybil in the living room window. Sybil on our bed. Sybil on the floor. There was nothing at all particularly noteworthy about any of these images, and I felt myself beginning to get frustrated with Amy. But with each picture I swiped past, I felt myself growing increasingly uneasy. In every shot, Sybil was sitting bolt upright, looking directly at the camera, her eyes wide and yellow, her mouth ever so slightly open. The pictures made me uncomfortable in a way that I couldn't rationalize. I called Amy. Did you see the pictures? She asked, her voice hushed. Yes, I answered. She looks okay to me. It wasn't a complete lie. What do you think is wrong? Eric, she whispered. I don't think that's Sybil. Don't be silly, I said. Of course it is. No, her fur is too coarse. I didn't really want to touch her, but I did. She feels different. Maybe she's just dirty, I offered. She did just spend the night in the woods. Her meow sounds weird. You heard it. She sounds off. I paused, thinking. I don't know, babe. Do you want to take her to the vet? She released a sigh of frustration. No, because it's not her. Amy, I chided. It's not. She insisted in a loud whisper. It's like someone's bad idea of her. I was beginning to get irritated. I don't know what to tell you, I said. She looks fine to me. She doesn't look fine to me, she responded, her voice hushed. Why are you whispering? I asked. I can barely hear you. Because she's listening to me, Amy said. She follows me everywhere and stares. Meetings resumed after lunch. I was seated at the head of a large table, men and women in suits on all sides. My presentation over, my only real duty for the afternoon was to sit and listen, or at least pretend to. My thoughts wandered to home, and I found myself concerned for Amy, even though deep down I convinced myself that she was overreacting. At the very least, I felt uneasy knowing she was concerned about her cat, who was having to deal with the situation by herself. It occurred to me that we hadn't even found a new vet for Sybil since we had moved to the new house. When my workday was over, I made excuses to get out of having a late dinner with my co-workers, feigning a headache and promising to see them all again early the next morning. I received a few more pats on the back, and even an awkward high five or two, and I did my best to force a smile in return. I waited until the solitude of my hotel room before looking at my phone again, a tight feeling in my chest as I did so. There was a single voicemail from Amy waiting for me. Eric, she said, and her voice was shaky. I couldn't tell if she was crying or scared, or both. Before she said another word, I heard a sound in the background, a low, mournful meowing in the distance. Do you hear that? she asked. She paused and the sound grew louder. The sound was terrible, mournful, and foreboding. My back and arms broke out in goosebumps as I listened. She's outside, Amy continued, and she sounded apologetic. I couldn't take it anymore, the staring. I pushed her out of the door with a broom. That was two hours ago. She hasn't stopped making that sound. Amy's voice hitched and, once again, I heard Sybil's cry, unpleasant and low, amazingly loud for it to be emanating from outside. I called Amy's cell. She answered with a whisper, saying my name. I could hear Sybil's low moans continuing in the background. 
Ames, I said. Where are you? I'm in the bedroom, she said. Is the cat still outside? Yes, she answered. Eric, I don't know what to do. She's been making this sound for hours, and she's still following me around. What do you mean? I asked. I was washing dishes at the kitchen sink, and she was right outside the window, looking at me. Then I saw her outside the living room window when I went in there. Every room I go to, she's just outside the window, sitting in the grass and looking at me, and making that sound. Amy began to cry. Do you want me to come home? I asked. I was surprised when she responded with a weak chuckle. It's so ridiculous, Eric, she said. It's just a stupid cat. She sniffled. No, it's stupid. I can't ask you to come home. I wish I was there, I said. Me too. I'll be home tomorrow evening and we'll figure this out, okay? Okay, she said. Put in some earplugs and try to sleep. I love you. You are my sunshine. My only sunshine. She responded, stifling a cry. As I pulled the phone away from my ear to end the call, the last sound I heard was Sybil, moaning. I was awakened by a chiming sound that roused me from a deep sleep. The hotel room was so dark and quiet that at first I had no idea where I was. My waking mind eventually recognized the sound as an incoming message on my cell phone. I sat up quickly and grabbed my phone, my heart beating rapidly in my chest, my mind fighting through a thick fog of sleep. The message from Amy was a single picture. It was blurry and almost completely white, a photo taken with a bright flash in a completely dark room. It took me a moment to recognize what I was seeing. Amy had taken the picture while sitting up in bed. I could see the wall of the bedroom beyond the foot of the bed. Amy's vanity and one of our wedding pictures on the far wall, all of it bathed in shadow. The wide blur in the foreground was mostly comprised of our bedspread covering Amy's legs. And on her lap sat Sybil, her disheveled fur blindingly white, her eyes wide and fixed hard on Amy. I turned on the light beside the bed and called Amy's cell. It rang three times, then went to voicemail. I hung up and tried again. Amy, I said, surprised to find myself out of breath. Amy, call me. I paced the floor. I sat on the bed. I looked again at the picture Amy had sent me. I grabbed my suitcase from the closet and began throwing clothes into it. I tried Amy's cell again. I closed the suitcase and sat down next to it. This is ridiculous, I said out loud and fell back on the bed. I stared at the white ceiling, at a fine crack that made its way from a corner of the room to a spot which ended with a water stain right above my head. For several minutes, my mind and my heart raced, and yet somehow, at some point, my eyes drifted shut and I fell to sleep. The gray-haired man in the blue suit standing at the far end of the room might as well have been speaking Japanese for all I was comprehending. My mind was far off, at home with Amy, not at this blasted meeting, surrounded by men in suits talking circles around the same discussion points that had been raised countless times in yesterday's sessions. I entertained the desire to upend the table, march across the room, and throttle him. I was allowing my uneasiness to give way to anger finding some temporary relief and channeling my anxiety at something other than the weirdness happening at home. I had of course attempted to call Amy again before I had left the hotel, and once more had gotten nothing but voicemail. My schedule for the day was a single three-hour meeting, followed by a quick drive to the airport and a flight home. I considered lying my way out of the meeting and getting an earlier flight. 
but I let better sense persuade me. I reminded myself that I and my wife were getting worked up by the odd behavior of a stupid cat. Now I imagined throttling Sybil, throwing her like a beanbag against any available hard surface, and I bit my lip. My phone chimed in my lap, and I jumped. A few of my co-workers seated nearby cast sidelong glances of disapproval. I picked up the phone, keeping it hidden under the table, and clicked on a new text from Amy. The image was a blur. I stared at it hard, but could make out nothing. It was white and red and brown and shapeless. I furrowed my brow. Another text. Another image. Amy's foot out of focus. The toenails painted red. A third image, indecipherable. A fourth image, nothing but a blur of white. A fifth image, this one clearer than the rest. Amy's face reflected in the mirror of her vanity. A fresh scratch on her cheek. She wasn't looking at her reflection. Her eyes were off to the side and cast downward. The look on her face, forlorn. Excuse me, I said, as I stood up from the table and exited the conference room. In the hallway, I called Amy's cell. It rang once, and then stopped. Amy? I said. Silence. No, not silence. Breathing. Amy? I asked again. Uh, Rick, she said, and my skin broke out in goosebumps. She sounded odd, almost like she was drunk. Are you okay? She took a deep breath. Come home. Come home? I asked. I thought for a moment. Okay, I'm coming home. Eric, she said again. I killed Sybil. Okay, baby, it's okay. I'll be there as soon as I can. Come home, she said. The drive to the airport, the wait in line, the flight, the drive home, all seemed interminable. The sky was black when I finally made the turn into our driveway. The house itself was completely dark, no light emanating from any of the windows, no exterior floods illuminated. I raised the garage door but stopped short of pulling the car in when I caught sight of the rabbit trap, still sitting in the middle of the garage floor. I killed the engine and exited the car. As I walked past the trap, I saw a white paper plate resting in the middle of it. It was licked clean. I opened the door to the kitchen and stepped inside. All was dark and silent. I flipped on a light. Amy? I called out. I threw my car keys on the table. They clashed noisily in the still quiet of the house. Amy? I yelled again. I went to the living room and turned on the light. She wasn't there. I made my way from room to room, turning on lights in each one, calling out her name. But Amy was nowhere to be found, and the house was unsettlingly silent. Back in the kitchen, my mind raced. I should try calling her again. I reached into my pocket for my phone, but then I realized I didn't have it. I had left it in the car. I retrieved the phone from the car and shut the door. Standing there in the driveway, I noted how eerily quiet the surrounding woods were. No chirping crickets, no croaking toads. I looked through the darkness to the edge of the woods at the north side of the driveway, to the small open space where Sybil had pursued whatever strange animal had wandered into our driveway two days ago. 
I imagined that I heard a branch snap. I decided not to linger. I re-entered the house through the kitchen door and locked it behind me. Back inside, I tried calling Amy's cell. No answer. I threw my phone down on the bed and ran my fingers through my hair. I was wondering if I should call the police when I was suddenly startled by a sound from outside. I couldn't tell what it was, but the word that immediately entered my mind was wailing. Low, slow, and mournful wailing. It was loud, but distant. I tried to convince myself that the voice wasn't familiar to me. I looked out the bedroom window, but could see nothing but darkness and the vaguest hint of the tree line behind our house. I fell back on the bed, grabbed one of my pillows, and put it over my head, hoping to muffle the sound. My heart was pounding. Sometime later, who knows how much time later, in the darkness of the bedroom, in the stillness of the night, and without realizing it was happening, I fell asleep, the sound outside like a distant, horrible lullaby. The next morning, as sunlight penetrated the window shades, washing the bedroom in a dim yellow light, I was awakened by Amy, the pressing weight of her as she gently straddled my legs. For a moment, I experienced the pleasant sensation of relief that one has when a particularly terrible nightmare gives way to the waking reality of morning. I grinned, stretched, and opened my eyes, meeting Amy's wide-eyed stare as she looked down on me. Only, it wasn't Amy. Her mouth hung open on one side, a string of drool dangling from her lip. One eye was larger than the other, and had drifted slightly to one side. Her hair was disheveled, and she smelled of earth. No, this wasn't Amy. This was someone's bad idea of Amy. She smiled at me, a crooked, hideous expression. My only sunshine. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed today's video. I want to give a huge thanks to all of my supporters over at Patreon and YouTube memberships. Your support makes these narrations possible, and I appreciate it a ton. If you'd like to join these lovely ghouls, you can head on over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash clancypasta, or click the join button below to become a member. And if you'd like creepy cool shirts, make sure to head on over and check out my official merch store for some awesome tees, hoodies, stickers, and more. Alright. Thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a great night. Cheers.